Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of UiPath Forward 2024. We are here in day two. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, alongside my co-host and analyst, Dave Vellante. We've got two guests for this section. Uh, Taki Joffrey, he's the Senior Director of Product Management at UiPath. Welcome, Taki. Thank you. And Ed Chalice, Head of AI Engineering at UiPath. Thank you both so much for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having us. So, I'm going to start, I'm going to start with you, Taki. You, you were on the main stage this morning. I think you're doing seven keynotes addresses uh, and you know saying not the demo here, you're yeah. demoing there tell tell us a little bit about about what you're doing here at the conference it's been it's been fantastic first of all thank you for having me here um, we are as you know sort of unveiling this vision of agentic automation and um, I'm just fortunate to represent the work of a fantastic team I'm just the face of it and uh, we are um, unveiling many things. One of the, the, the sort of premier thing is the agent builder. So uh, how RPA developers can build their own agents and deploy them. Um, and we like to say that it's not just about deploying agents, it's about deploying agents that work well. So we are also, uh, as part of the agent builder, giving you the ability to evaluate them, test them, and actually monitor them while they're running. So it's a um, it's a very, let's say, a deeply rooted um, vision that we have. So just excited to be here and talk about that with you today. So if I had to summarize sort of the strategy, I'd say, okay, UiPath strategy is to leverage the core capabilities that it's developed over the last 10 years, and installed in you know, 10,000 plus customers, and then supercharge them with, with AI. You know, it's like Jensen says, we're going to supercharge you with GPUs. Well, you got to supercharge your customers with AI. You're going to build on top of that. Um, so my question is, first of all, is that sort of an accurate, simplified version? And is it necessary to have that underlying infrastructure? And if so, why? Yeah, I think that is a great question. Um, yeah, I, I think you know, at core screen level, it is definitely a technology which can supercharge the entire kind of digital estate of a business. Um, and in some sense, I would say that automation is a kind of necessary prerequisite. So we heard our chief product officer make this analogy that uh, agentic, you know, without automation is like a plane without a pilot uh, or a body without a brain. Um, you know, without taking actions, without causing changes, um, you're ultimately just a kind of advisor um, you can provide useful text, but you're not actually doing anything that moves the needle. So, you know, automation um, kind of closes the gap uh, for, for AI and is a really kind of critical component. Are you using software robots and automation as interchangeable? Is that, um, but yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just take that. The way, we, the way we think about it, and we actually said this on stage, is agents, are nothing without the tools, right? Because to me, an agent needs to have agency, which means it needs to act. Like Ed said, more than just advise you with some text, it actually needs to take an action. And in order to, in order to take action, we believe the best way to do that is with robots. And we've spent, if you think about it, <laughs> decade or so, preparing for this moment almost by shipping all these robots which are well governed, uh, they're trusted, uh, they work well, uh, but they're very deterministic, right? And that's a good thing. And now we have this non-deterministic agent which is sort of launching them and running them. Uh, so that's, that's how I think about it. Okay, let me back up. Help the audience understand, help me understand. Define the difference between a, 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 a bot or an automation and an, and an agent. <laughs> I take that? Or? Yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, I think so. A bot is, it's the actions it takes is completely defined by the control flow that the developer creates. So there's logic um, and a predefined kind of set of procedures which define the flow. An agent is defined by an objective, a goal, and then it has tools at its disposal, a memory at its disposal to try and achieve that goal. And it does so in a kind of recursive way. So it will maybe get some information, um, read that information, decide what next step to take, um, and, and iteratively do that until it thinks it's achieved its goal. And a bot is better than microservices because it's governed, it's secure, it's got 
you know, yeah. a richer ca set of capabilities, correct? Yeah, exactly. So with a bot, you not only tell it what to do, you tell it how to do it. You, you code the bot. Yep. With an agent, you just tell it what you want done and it decides how to do it. It comes up with the plan dynamically, right? So that to me is the key difference, which is the control flow, the how it achieves the objective is determined sort of on the fly by the agent. Indeed, you can run it multiple times and it might achieve the same objective multiple different ways because sometimes these things are uh, stochastic, non-deterministic, non right? So I think that's the key difference. Uh, the microservices analogy is interesting because to me that's about factoring or decomposing uh, agents into smaller pieces and we actually talked about that and this concept of having these sort of single-minded agents maybe you want to you want to address that question about like decomposing things and the reason I, I use that analogy because they're hard-coded yeah right yeah and, and but whereas I, I think agents are not right as yeah, you exactly. just described exactly yeah, I mean, so I think there's two ways, like the microservice thing, I mean, a bot gives you kind of more access to more information, go via the UI, process on structured data, they're just kind of purely programmatic. Um, but yeah, you know, agency, it, it can solve fundamentally new problems. Ones where the data is too variable for you to hard code specific instructions. Um, you know, the, maybe the data changes from run to run or situations where there's just too much complexity to define the path, there's too much kind of nuance in the process, it's a little bit too messy. And then there's a whole bunch of tasks that take up a lot of people's time, but each task individually doesn't take up a lot of time, doesn't happen that frequently, right? So you might have a whole bunch of travel-related work, but actually you're not like searching for a flight hundreds of times, you're searching for a flight, then you're checking the details, you're maybe changing the seats. There's a whole bunch of different actions there. Cool. So, you know, um, agents attack those kind of problems, the hard, and maybe the, you know, not worth it with traditional automation or the kind of variability uh, challenge. But you guys are making the case, if I understand it correctly, that, that RPA, automations, bots, whatever we want to call them, is a fundamental, I'll just even say prerequisite to successful uh, agentic systems. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely, because if you just want your agent to, in Ed's words, just advise you, then you perhaps don't need robots. You just need a chat bot, you ask a question, it just answers you in text, then you, get, then you don't necessarily need robots. But if you actually want your agent to take action on your behalf, you need to give it these tools. And again, we believe these robots, these robotic automations that UiPath has spent years building are the best kind of tools. Okay. Um, so yes, that's a very uh, accurate characterization. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I want to build systems of agency that exactly. transform my business and give me exactly. massive competitive advantage and cut my cost by, by t 10x yeah. and, 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 and dramatically accelerate my time to an outcome. That's All what you I have want. to do is tell it to do yeah. that. And, and that's what I want. That's the future that I want. And, and, and if I, my big takeaway of this conference is, is, is you need automations to do that. The, the companies, your customers that have built those automations are in a much better competitive position. So I can fi if I can figure out who those, you know, we look at, we look at tech companies and tech stocks, we say, oh wow, NVIDIA, well great if we could have called that, as many folks did. But if I could understand the customers that are deploying these systems, whether it's GE, GE's actually back on fire, which is kind of interesting, I wonder how much you know, your automations have helped. But you know what I'm saying is, is if, if I could bet on those companies that are applying those automations, yeah. they're going to dominate their industries, you're going to feed them, Absolutely. you're going to do well as a result. Absolutely. But that's a really interesting investment angle that I hadn't really grokked until I came here. Not, not yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'd actually like to double click on something you said where you just tell it what to do and it does it. There's actually a really interesting uh, uh, tweet that went really viral by a, by a, by a famous science scientist, uh, Andre Karpathy. Some, some folks might have heard of him. Yeah. It was from about two years ago and just a one-liner, uh, which is English is the hottest programming language. Yes. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's a really amazing way of saying it, what you just said. But I think there's a corollary to that statement, which is, well, English is also vague sometimes and ambiguous, right? So And nuanced, yeah. And nuanced, yeah, right? You're right? But like code where you're very specifically telling it. So the this whole, another really sort of, it's a nuanced point, but I'd like to still try to make it, 
which is yes, you just tell it what to do, but you A, have to be very, very specific. And the way we think the best way to do this is to have a bunch of specialized agents which are single-minded and you do they do one thing and then you connect them in an orchestration which is exactly what UiPath loves to do. So we actually spent a bunch of time talking about controlled agency uh, which is this entire concept um, in the previous keynote that we just came from. Yeah, there's no one-to-one -one kind of, you can't have an agent that is an equivalent of a person, right? An agent will do a much narrower set of tasks and really focus on that. And then, you know, the benefit of that is it makes it much easier to test, much easier to validate, uh, easier to improve. Um, so that's the kind of pattern that we're going to see emerge, really specialized agents and orchestration to bring it together. So what is your vision for how humans and agents and robots will work together? I mean, obviously, we know English majors are going to have a job security for life now in this new economy. <laughs> but how do you see them collaborating and how is this going to change workforce dynamics? I think it's a really interesting question. I think, you know, the t time will tell, right? And uh, the kind of, the, what we as a kind of society have to do is we have the tools now. We kind of need to just iterate and see what works because sometimes, you know, th the models underlying this is generative AI and sometimes it astounds you with what it can do and sometimes you're really frustrated you're because deflated. it can't exactly. do it, you're deflated. You're either astounded or deflated. That's so true. And actually even people that work in the field can't confidently predict, I really thought I'd be able to do that or, you know, wow, you know. So I think in every kind of line of business, there's a kind of process of trial and error that actually has to happen and that's going to take time to propagate through, through our businesses. So can we paint a picture? I love working with you because you go right to the, you know, the human humanization aspect. I want to dig into the stack. So what does the new sort of agentic stack look like? I got infrastructure as a service, cloud, on-prem, that's cool. I have data, whether it's a data lake or a snowflake, or I got a bunch of data. I feel like there's got to be a way to harmonize that data. You can help me understand how you do that. And then you've got this agent control framework, I think you guys are calling it orchestration. It can interpret top-down goals and then it can execute bottom-up uh, outcomes. It's got connectors to all these, what you have through APIs or other integrations to back-end systems, whether they're analytic systems or CRMs or ERPs. And, and that's sort of this, and, and, and there's a UI emerging, which is, according to Daniel, going to coexist with existing CLIs and, and other interfaces. Um, but, but there's an NLP interface as well emerging, and that's this sort of rough picture of the application stack that's emerging. How do you guys see it, and, and, and where do you fit in that? Oh, there's so much to say. So maybe <laughs> I'll, um, I'll sort of start bottom up, maybe. Great. Or top down, but let's just go bottom up. Sure. So, well, first there's the actual models, right? Like Ed said, this is powered by generative AI, so, uh, we have a partnership with Anthropic that we announced. They have fantastic models. OpenAI, of course, is doing great work. Uh, there's a fantastic work going on in the open source world with Meta's Llama family. So I think uh, Daniel put this perfectly. He said we're going to be the Switzerland, I think he said. So we'll work with everybody, although we'll have partnerships with some. So that's the first thing, that's the model. And the model sort of is the underpinnings of all of it. Then above that, there's typically a trust layer because you want to make sure the model is complying with your policies, if there's personally identified information, identifiable information, PII, that you want to strip out. So we have our LLM trust layer. Uh, others do as well, you know, ours is pretty good. And then uh, on top of that, you have um, essentially what you said, you know, these ways of pulling in data. So, so you just don't query these models directly, you want to pull in some data and then you query them. So there's all these connectors, tools, we call them. Um, and these tools sort of go both ways. You sort of pull data in to give to the LLM, but sometimes the LLM responds back and says, hey, to fully service your request, I need you to go query a system or something, right? So these tools are sort of both ways. In the art, this is called function calling sometimes, yeah, sure. right? Uh, some of these models natively support function calling. And then, um, I think it's very important to have uh, this conversation that you sort of briefly said, which is what are the best user experiences on top of these agents? So 
There's, of course, the conversational experiences that everybody's familiar with, chat GPT, you know, which is amazing, you know, Claude, uh, all these great experiences. But not everything can be achieved with a conversational experience. Right. And indeed, you're already seeing these agents evolve. Sometimes you ask them a question and they respond with a visual, right? They respond with a chart now, right? So, and then everybody's heard of these things where, you know, you can actually send in a voice stream or send a picture to the agent. So these things are becoming multimodal. Mm. But I think those are still roughly conversational experiences. I think you have an attachment to a message, but I think it will really evolve. And I like to think about it as, of course, we support these conversational experiences. We have autopilot for everyone. You can also build a conversational experience in our agent builder. So this is table stakes. Of course, we do this. But what I'm really excited about personally is sort of what I call it's not an official word, but like an ambient agent, you know, something that does not really have a user experience. It's almost like an activity in a workflow. It's taking information from somewhere and putting it somewhere else with zero user experience. So I think that to me is the stack. I went really fast. Maybe you want to... Um, no, that was pretty comprehensive. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Can there I ask go. a question about that? So the trust layer, that's that includes you know, security, governance, uh, is okay. in that layer. Monitoring. Yes. How does the bot, what's the relationship between the bot, because we heard yesterday that you, know, you trust bots, you're not going to trust the LLM. Makes sense. How does the bot take advantage of that trust layer? Is that trust layer sort of, and, and is the bot encompassed in the trust layer? Is it sort of injected into the, into the bot? Yeah, maybe I can talk about that. It's a product question. So I would slightly rephrase that. I think what we said is you can't trust agents. Um, but you can trust robots, right? So, yeah. and I think the you actually can trust agents if you only let them have agency through robots, right? I think yeah. Daniel said something on stage like, "Don't give an agent your password or something." Right. I think that's a, that was just you know a fantastic way of saying it. But but I think of course you can have an agent do secure things uh, through a robot. So the robot can have your credentials and all these things. It can be governed. So the way I think about the trust layer is it actually it's. It's sort of, it's the sandbox to both of them. And today, before agents, robots can actually use generative AI, can use LLMs. We have these gen AI activities and things like that, mm -hmm. that all go through the trust layer. So, you know, you can put rules saying, here's my business policies, don't violate them, et cetera. Um, and agents will just go through the same trust layer. So it's sort of like, it's the sandbox. It's the controls around the sandbox for both of them. So you essentially can't do anything without that trust layer. It has to. It has to go through the trust layer. Yeah. And and what about? Uh, I'm like stuck on this data harmonization. Um, <laughs> it just seems to me that there has to be a way because I got all these different data sources. How do I know that revenue is revenue and it's not bookings and it's not NRR or AR or quarterly revenue or calendar year revenue? How do I know that? Who figures that out? Is that the agent? Is that the bot? Is there another layer that emerges from a third party? Is it a knowledge graph? Does it matter? I feel like yeah, that's a problem that kind of needs to be resolved independently of this. You know, yep. a, you know, agents and humans. You know, you can view an agent as a kind of you know um, an approximate human, right? And humans make those mistakes. Hey, the same day. problem. <laughs> that's, uh, okay, but that's not your swim lane. Yeah, what I'm hearing. But the but the what I call the uh, the agent. Uh, control framework absolutely is, and that's a really high value piece of real estate. Yes. And inherent in there is the ability to access, I think you said this before, access tools. Yes. Whatever those tools may be. Exa yes. Exactly, and like if you take that kind of revenue example, you might use a robot or an, uh, you know, to get the right revenue number to feed to an agent, right? And then the developer has that design authority, so you're not letting the agent kind of pick the the column header that it thinks is most likely to be the revenue number. So uh, Rebecca and I were talking in our open this morning about our nirvana is a company like UiPath creates the abstraction across all these stovepipe applications and we, we utilize your framework for our Gentic system. Mm -hmm. But the reality of our industry is that Oracle's going to have its agent framework and Salesforce and ServiceNow and Palantir and all these apps are going to be in their own stovepipes. Your strategy, I think, is to is to be Switzerland yep. across those. Yep. And that's going to be the interesting, I don't even want to call it a battle, it's just the evolution of, of our industry. I, I hope 
that you can succeed wildly. <laughs> <laughs> it will make all of our lives easier. But, yeah, but, so as well. but, but these other apps aren't going to make it, they're not going to necessarily try to stop you from doing that, but they're going to want to control their own little domains, right? And they're going to have little hooks and features that but, attract people. But I, you know, I, I think we're going to see this Cambrian explosion of agents and, and it will make sense for big, important applications to have their own agents that right. really deeply understand their world. But just as you do with people, we have specialists, then you'll need coordinators, managers, you know, middlemen, uh, and orchestration on top of that. Yeah, makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for the perfect. Ed and Taki, a great conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of UiPath Forward. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.